Hello and welcome to episode number 337 of the Armin Show podcast. We have been doing wonderful episodes every week coming out on Monday. Subscribe on YouTube, listen in on the website, Spotify, wherever it might be. Glad to have you on here. We're learning about science, people, creativity, and much more. On this one here, we have the author of this fine book, which I've seen two different covers of. They both look great. Kingdom of Characters by Professor Jing Su, who joins me today. I will give a backstory, but first, Jing Su, welcome to the show. Thank you, Armin. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you on. You are at Yale University. You are also a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow. You specialize in modern Chinese literature, which makes sense, and culture, and Sinophone studies from the 19th century to the present. You are the John M. Schiff Professor of East Asian Languages and Literatures and Comparative Literature Chair at the Council on East Asian Studies at Yale University, which is wonderful. I've spoken to many individuals from that wonderful institution. There's a few institutions that I've noticed. I've talked to a lot of people. So if I went there one day, maybe I'll go visit or walk around or something like that. Now, how, how before we get into the book, how did you get, why is your interest in this category versus the multitude of categories that are out there? What attracts you to literature, language? Did someone guide you or was it just you? Mm. So my entry into literary studies actually has to do with, um, I have to say, probably limitations that I recognized early on in my own abilities to do anything else. Um, I realized that literary studies was going to be a backstage pass into basically every other field that I was interested in, but without the liability. And there's just a lot more flexibility and creativity that someone who studies literature can do than, let's say, someone in sciences. It's true. There's much more flexibility. It's a nice feature that we take on. Limitation is such a strong pull. I've talked about that. I think I had one full episode about the power of limitation as a kind of motivator or like, that's what I'm going to do. We suddenly are in a box and then, okay, I will work within this versus the vast expanse. We are, there's nothing for us to bounce off of back to us. There's no borders, if you will. It's nice to have limitation in a way. Now, um, Chinese literature versus other ones. Why specifically Chinese literature? Did you see any qualities of it that were interesting? Is it because of um, people you have read from or where is it from? Well, interestingly enough, I've always been attracted to things that are off the beaten path as a way of coming back to things that we're familiar with. And at the time I decided going to Chinese studies, China was certainly on the rise, but I think no one could have predicted what would happen and that would actually become such a dominant global power today. And so it was a good time, but also to me, it was kind of an adventurous frontier uh, to other things that, that, were, that people were preoccupied with here. Um, you know, I went into academia as uh, kind of a literary scholar, but did a lot of philosophy and critical theory and psychoanalysis and post-structuralism. These were sort of the heydays in the late 90s. Um, and then it also always didn't sit right with me. I never felt that, um, you know, re reading content of philosophy was something that really spoke to questions I had about the Chinese context, about non-Western context. So it seemed illogical and it seemed like the right choice to go into Chinese studies also because of my own personal connections, familiar connections to China. Uh, and also because as I talk about in Kingdom of Characters is also my mother tongue. And of course, a lot of what I end up reflecting is precisely the importance of language in opening up worlds and also explaining the conflicts between those worlds. Mm -hmm. You have a variety of stories in the book that take us through like each step of maybe a change in the language or how it's adapted to the current form. Before we get into that, what are, if we had to speak about languages in the world, what are the groupings of them and how are they separate? What are the categories of languages? Where does Chinese fit in? Where does, uh, let's say, English fit in? Um, or they well, it kind of depends on who you ask. I mean, I think the one that people are most, most familiar with is Indo-European, but there's also the Tibetan Sinitic, and it really depends on how you group them. I mean, certainly, for instance, if you go to 
uh, Taiwan in the 1990s. They'll tell you that they're actually part of an Austronesian, Austronesian linguistic family, but that's also a, a very politicized kind of explanation. So I think, you know, language family, and also we go back to the original, uh, I think, premise of Indo-European Indo uh, languages, which was proposed by William Dwight Whitney, the linguist that sort of came up with the idea and sort of organizing families that families of languages that way. I mean, that itself is also very influenced by its time. So I think language groupings are different. But when you're talking specifically about writing systems, right, sort of committing idea of the concept of language to materiality, then I think it actually becomes uh, more clarifying. So for instance, you think of ideographic writing, or we talk about sort of Chinese writing. Um, this is a very different form uh, that's quite insular from what we think of as the Western alphabet. The thing I like is that the examples actually shown got me to look at the language. The funny thing is I've seen it so many times in my existence. And early on in my, when I was young, I had a really good friend who was Chinese and I would see so many of his newspapers and whatnot. And the differences were obvious, but they were not obvious until I read some parts of your book. Then I was like, oh, wait a minute, that's that. And that's why the letters are, or the uh, messages are all together. There's no spaces. Like you had mentioned that spaces are uh, like another letter in our language. There's so many elements that if you see it, you don't know. Then after you learn about it, now you're like, oh, okay, that's what that was. It feels like you already knew it beforehand, but I didn't. So interesting factoid. We have a limited number of letters in our language. Chinese has had many and also has a reduced form. Can you tell us about the forms and how many letters there are from someone who has learned a lot of them? Well, first of all, I'm delighted that it's had a kind of personal revelation for you because I start, have to say certainly since the book came out, I've received these wonderful letters from readers with very similar experiences where they shared with me, not just their experience with Chinese language, but also having lived in Asia, but also the remarkable kind of um, how they never reflected that much on what alphabetic language actually meant to them. Um, and one of my favorite ways, uh, and I was very pleased that um, they especially pointed out this section in chapter four of the book, where I start out by asking the reader to go through this thought, you know, going to this thought experiment with me, where I ask, imagine thinking about the Western alphabet and organizing it in the way that you would have to with tens and thousands of characters, right? That is to say, organize them by shape rather than the kind of ABC order that we completely take for granted. You know, that's actually one of the main powers of the alphabet, that it comes in not only 26 letters, but successive in a certain kind of order that becomes quite powerful to then to use to organize other things, like anything from a laundry list to a telephone book. Even your computer files are sort of still organized alphabetically. And so I think that that kind of very peculiar property of alphabet is often taken for granted by its native speakers, just as Chinese is taken for granted by its own native speakers. I often tell people, I certainly would never want to learn Chinese as a, as a second language because I think it would just be so hard if I had not been born into it. But if you were to rethink about the Western alphabet in terms of Chinese characters who are organized by shapes, you have to say that, you know, for instance, O, capital O, C, Q have to be grouped together because they share a kind of circular contour. Or if you go by the number of strokes, right? That is to say, how many lines per letter. And you have to go in, let's say, the descending order, starting with the most strokes. Then the capital letter E will have to be at the start of the alphabet instead of A. So it's sort of a very sort of transformative way that we think about and we don't realize how important it is until, for instance, you know. In, in um, you know, since we're, we're in February, we just, in, in March, actually, so we just had the Winter Olympics. You know, one of the uh, important things at the Olympics is the opening ceremony where there's a parade of nations. And all nations come in normally according to alphabetic order, except the first one's always Greece, just because that is where the Olympics started. So they always come in first, but then you start with A, B, C, D, and down all the way to Z. Now, when the Olympics was held in China, now this just last month, it actually could not go by alphabet letters because Chinese didn't use Western alphabet. So the order in which the nations came in were actually according to the stroke count of the first character of their country, right? In, rendered in Chinese names. So for instance, you get Greece coming in still, but then the next one is actually Turkey, which an alphabet will be T, which should be way down towards the end of the, of the parade of nations. But lo and behold, Turkey came second because the first character of 
Turkey, which is rendered Tu, has three strokes. And so, you know, what that generated, you know, you wouldn't think, okay, so you, you mess up the order a little bit that way. It's not such a big deal. But it actually can have very, very um, dramatic political consequence. Because this year, the controversy was Taiwan, which usually, by an agreement in 1981, which we don't have to talk about now, it's a long, complicated history, of course, because Taiwan cannot represent itself as a nation. Um, internationally because it's not recognized except for now 14, 15 countries. And so Taiwan was going to be going to come in as Chinese Taipei. And the next one would be Chinese Hong Kong. Now, so Taiwan actually objected very, uh, very strongly to this because it did not want to be treated the same as Chinese Hong Kong, right? Which is kind of with the, the whose, whose relationship and status vis-a-vis -vis mainland China with the PRC is very clear. So Taiwan in Chinese is Zhonghua Taipei versus Chinese Hong Kong, which is Zhongguo Xiangang. So there's a difference between Zhonghua and Zhongguo. Hua being more of a cultural affiliation, whereas Zhongguo is very clearly nationalist. Um, so that difference made, China, made Taiwan very nervous and it sort of objected to being, uh, to have to be you know, right next to Hong Kong uh, in the Parade of Nations. Now, this happened, of course, this is not the first time that China hosted the Olympics. The last and the first time that China hosted the Olympics was in 2008. And it was also the same back in 2008, but lo and behold, someone saved the day because at the time, Central African Republic also participated. And in Chinese, it happens to start with the same character, Zhong Middle. And so it was wedged between Taiwan and Hong Kong. And so this political controversy was blunted in 2008. So, you know, this example between 2008 to 2022 Olympics, I use this example to illustrate the fact that order really matters, the kind of alphabetic order and what language system you use really kind of impacts a lot of interpretation and politicization of what actually happens. It will take the order because it, right, it's like, oh, first, second, third, who is relevant. I don't want to be compared with them. It matters in that uh, context and it's a very presentational activity. So, Well, it's important what goes next to what. So as an alphabet user, you can ima never imagine, you know, C next to Q in the alphabet. Right. No. But if you were to reorganize the Western alphabet, think about it vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese language, that's kind of what you end up with. And so the organization principle would be completely, so just the fact of organizing itself would require a lot more work than what is simply taken for granted when we look at ABCs and use phrases like A list, B plan, or you know, uh, or, yeah. So, so that kind of order doesn't come readily, and it's not obvious. We take it for granted. Things that's just automatic, but no, it's not automatic elsewhere in some condition. That's kind of cool. Bigger perspective, which is good. I always support bigger perspective, having understanding, and then obviously some of these things would be noticed about. Uh, English from the Chinese perspective as well. Now, as far as the strokes, which you have mentioned, and the shape, which is something we don't even look at usually with like E or M or L, uh, what you describe the strokes in detail in the book, are there a common set? What should the average person know about how many strokes an average uh, character includes? Is it difficult? Well, there, there, there are eight basic stroke types. Some say five. And stroke type is simply, okay, first of all, let's define what a stroke is so people understand. A stroke is a line that you can draw on, with a pen on the surface without lifting, lifting it, without lifting your pen, okay? So for instance, the Western alphabet's also made up of strokes, but we don't really think of it that way. For instance, the capital letter A is actually you actually, the way we write it is actually three strokes. But we don't think of strokes as kind of a basic element or unit in the construction of alphabet letters. Whereas in Chinese character writing, you do. Now, but strokes is also not the only element or the only unit that matters because strokes come together to form characters, but they first form these subunits of characters. So you have to think of, you know, we talk about how Western alphabet is kind of letter next to one another, sort of kind of like rolling out like a, like a, like a line. But for Chinese characters, the characters are built kind of like clusters of parts that are kind of nestled inside one another within kind of an imaginary square space. That's when you look at character writing, 
whether street sign or on the menu, you know, it usually comes, you can tell it's almost like blockish in shape, right? You must have seen seen characters yes. before. So that that square shape is kind of the imaginative space that kind of in which we fit these parts together that go into characters. So these components are themselves are so components are basically strokes coming together in particular patterns. So a lot of Chinese character composition is based on shape patterns. Shape patterns. Now, just for a basic person, let's say a person knows English. What's the level of difficulty to transition to knowing Chinese versus other languages? Would it be like if uh, learning, let's say, Spanish was a five, is, is Chinese like, and five is average, would it be like a much higher? Well, you'll, you'll have to, you have to ask, you know, all these students who are learning Chinese for the first time as freshmen in colleges. And I have to say within four years, they seem to handle Beijing Chinese just fine. So I have to say level difficulty is also depending on perception, because I think Chinese used to seem impossible to learn. But not so much right now. People pick it up. It's being taught in junior highs, even elementary schools. So I think the way we think, you know, how we used to say, "It's all Greek to me," you know, that colloquial phrase is, yes. or "It's all Chinese to me." And I think it's really kind of a, you know, it really depends. I think things are, for instance. So I'll give a historical example. Long before the Western alphabet come, came along in Asia, Chinese was actually used as the ABCs and the lingua franca of Asia, of East Asia. That is to say. Koreans used it, Japanese used it, even the Vietnamese used it, but they used Chinese characters to sound out their own writing system. So in other words, Chinese was actually used phonetically like an alphabet. So, you know, is, so before there was ABCs, that worked perfectly well because, you know, a lot about language is kind of habits of mind. You know, we're accustomed to thinking a certain way. Um, and if you're accustomed to difficulty, then it doesn't seem difficult, right? It's only when there's a point of reference. So for instance, for China that came in late 19th century, where you know, character writing seemed kind of inefficient, it seemed to slow down the process of modernization. And people start thinking that something that's somehow inferior to the Western alphabet. And that had always not, that had not always been the case because in 17th century, for instance, or 18th century, even the Europeans very much revered Chinese writing for being precisely so like so pictographic. It was not, to them, it seemed like it really resembled objects and things as they were, rather than kind of mediated through an abstraction like writing. So, you know, there was some reverence that went into that, but also because Europe at the time was kind of figuring out, you know, trying to sort themselves out and they had come out of an era of wars and conflicts. So they were looking for kind of uh, a sort of unifying universal um, power in language. And so this was the, the era of the, of the seek of the pursuit of something called the universal language. So it kind of attracted Jesuits, you know, not, not Jesuits, but also missionaries, um, scholars um, of various kinds, savants, to the idea of the Chinese language, and even to Arabic to some extent, as languages somehow came closer. In fact, Chinese was called or dubbed the mother tongue of God. That is a strong statement. Yes, it is. The, it's like a base. Uh, not statement I made. I'm just, right, I just, right. I'm more of a historian that way. But right. I have to say, perception changed over time. So just so when you ask something like, how difficult is Chinese? Right. It's really actually kind of a relative question to our time. There will be one point where it seemed impossible, just as it seemed really primitive and backward. And other times where it seemed it's like any other. It just takes time to learn. And it's not backward. It actually has its own logic and it has its own unique function. Right. It has certain kind of properties that Western alphabet doesn't. The real question is whether writing and thinking and using different language systems actually make us different because we've certainly gone to wars. We're suspicious of people who don't speak our own language. In fact, in fact, who the people we consort, people we're friends with, you know, people we read, of course, they're all most, you know, first and more, foremost, they use the same language as we do. I mean, unless you're bilingual, but that's or trilingual, but that's a different, that's a different case. Yeah. What is your what is your mother tongue, Armin? Well, I am Persian Armenian, so I basically mostly only speak English. I know some Armenian, I can understand some, but my parents would know 
Farsi, Armenian, and English. So they, they would know all three. So if I knew my mother tongue from Iran, I would know Farsi. And then from my Armenian background, I would know Armenian. I can understand some, but I don't write it that much. But well, most people's relationship to their mother tongue. So did your parents want you to learn yeah. those languages when you were growing up? Relatively, yeah, I would say yes. Did you embrace it or not so much? Some, some Armenian. So I can still understand it if a conversation is happening somewhat. Uh, but as far as going further into that, I left it alone and got really good at English and vocabulary and all kinds of that category. So that's my, as far as my uh, past. But then I will say in, in recent time, I've started looking at various languages, posting quotes of messages in French or Chinese or um, Spanish. And then I did some uh, Google Translate to tweet to people in different languages. I've been having this thing where I'm thinking, do, what do you think about this, by the way, in the category of linguistics in the next 10 years, will we be able to, like, I talk in English and then the other person hears it in Chinese and then we can. Well, I, I love that you brought that up because I was just going to say, like, how, how, how much, like, how necessary would it be for you to learn Farsi if you can actually just kind of put things in the Google Translate, right, or scan a foreign menu? Um, this is kind of one of the things that the technological threshold or technological age really force upon us is this idea of what is really language, what does language mean to us now when it's all represented in binary codes in a computer and what kind of spits out, you know, on a, on, as a font on a screen or printed on a paper is really kind of like the visual form, right? The body form, but it's not written, right? We don't write languages anymore. We don't write the alphabet. We type it most of all. In fact, I don't know about you, but you know, many people I know, probably myself included, our handwriting has certainly deteriorated, which is something you know, some of the Chinese government was very concerned about uh, because people are typing in Chinese and they don't really learn calligraphy or writing. They don't learn the order of strokes. It's actually very important in Chinese writing as a kind of learned, you know, cultivated pursuit. And also what happened to the Chinese language to cross this threshold. So, you know, digital age has had a huge impact on Chinese language in the sense that if your language doesn't exist in the computing age, it basically kind of doesn't exist at all. If you can think of all the amenities of computing, I mean, it's basically part of us. I think it's more like, a, like an extension. This is like an, ex my phone is like an extension of me, right? And um, it's very hard to imagine that if you cannot find or type or use a language in a, on your iPhone or you know, on a laptop, then would that language be at danger of dying out? And this is precisely kind of a concern that the Chinese had in the 60s, 70s when they were talking about how to get Chinese into the computer because it was not easy and it was not obvious. And at that time in the 60s already computing, you know, there used to be these mainframe computers that are used for calculation tasks, the original ones. Yeah, that is correct. They're like a room size. You walk into a room of computer, right? The computer was not exactly desktop size. And, you know, but quickly they discovered that computer is not just good for that, but it's also good for the use of language, human languages for information processing. And that was going to revolutionize our world. It's basically when we send files back and forth from Paris to Tokyo, or when, you know, we text back and forth. And something has to ensure that, you know, the file I send you from, you know, some remote part of, you know, China, you're going to be able to read with no problem, with no gibberish or, you know, question marks is going to translate perfectly. Because at the time when computers were first made, they were also made by different vendors, right? So they all had their own way of, you know, encoding and the computers didn't necessarily translate or talk to each other. It's kind of like, you know, like, so an IBM didn't really talk to a Mac. So there were a lot of things that had to be done to uh, to reconcile and unify that system so that everyone can use it. And so for China, that was a big question is how do you, first of all, how you encode Chinese characters? So this is where this, this is where chapter six came in in my book, where I talk about there's this um, misprisoned uh, inmate during Cultural Revolution, and he was an engineer, and he really was one of the many intelligentsia who were actually came under suspicion and you know, was basically um, labeled as counter-revolutionary, reactionary, so on and so forth. And so Zhi Bingyi, which was his name, he sat in this cowshed for, for several months, um, almost two years. 
And, you know, on his wall was this um, message that was given to all prisoners to reflect on, basically try to, try to um, motivate them into giving confessions. And all of a sudden, one day, he started looking at them differently, look at these characters and thinking. So instead of absorbing the message or the state, he's like thinking, how wonderful would it be if I can get these characters into computer so that they can work? So he had to, he immediately fixated on this, this, this project that was bigger than himself and um, no doubt took his mind off being a prisoner. And he started every day to recall all the characters that he could remember on the lid of a teacup that he had in the prison cell. I mean, you were given like, you know, probably like a cup or something to drink out of. And at the end of every day, he would then wipe off all the characters so that he has surface error to start again the next day. So from memory, he started working out each of these characters, how should they be encoded by? And his idea was, well, and this is kind of interesting because he was using a hybrid system. He said, I still wanna keep Chinese characters, but maybe I can romanize all these different characters and then romanize their parts, right? Because remember earlier I said that characters are made of simpler characters called components. So you can, these simpler components, characters can also have their own romanization. You can romanize them. He said, then I'll take the first letter of each of those characters and put them together. So for, for instance, you can think of, um, let's say you can say, um, you know, Zhonghua Mingguo, you know, China, let's say, and you can take the first letter of each of those characters. So it'd be Z, H, um, M, and then G. And if you put that into the computer, it would, it's a code that would recognize that those are the four characters that are meant. So he sort of uses alphabet to tag different parts of the character so that the character can still re-romanize and come out like a perfectly uh, designed code of four letters. So that was his one of his way of rethinking Chinese characters so that can be more amenable to the computing age. Because once you can render Chinese predictably into a kind of a code, alphabetic code, then you can put it in the computer system like any other Western letter. So this is one of the ways in which you would get Chinese into the computer. But it was absolutely critical because at the time Chinese were thinking, okay, we could either design a computing ecosystem all of our own with Chinese programming language, you know, Chinese codes, like forget the alphabet. But that would take so long that, you know, one of the great lessons of the book is really that, you know, technology really relies on the first mover advantage, right? It's like why we still use, if you look down at your computing keyboard now, it's still QWERTY keyboard. Yeah. Thank you for being so responsive, Armin. <laughs> like, look at your Just keyboard. Just confirming it, like it didn't change today or something. And a QWERTY keyboard makes no sense today because it was a risk that layout was so that in the old days, you know, if you're typing too fast, you know, typer had these hammers that would stick together. So they reorganized the layout so that you have know, QWERTY, which is the, you know, Q-W-E-R-T-Y on the top row of your keyboard is meant so that it will slow you down. But that's not a problem these days. We don't even use mechanical typewriters, but the QWERTY keyboard is completely assimilated and habituated in our everyday usage. Like we can't really imagine other ways of using a keyboard. But what is interesting is also now, you know, let's say the keyboard was really invented because there's no other way of putting our thoughts into the machine, right? We had to find keyboard was a way of mediating what we were thinking, right? So it processed almost like, I'm thinking a thought, I'm rendering into language, I type out this language, right, in the written form, and I type it out on a keyboard as a way of communicating with the machine, whether it's a typewriter or computer, so that the machine can kind of translate this. So keyboards and even writing system is a way of kind of communicating the thoughts that are in our head, which, as you know, is kind of like an experiential jumble of, you know, mess that we somehow render into language and then language into written form written form into technology and technology into communication. So, you know, this process itself is very arduous, but it's also important that it's because we otherwise didn't have a way of directly putting our thoughts into the machine. But now we're getting closer and closer, right? Because now Chinese doesn't just rely on keyboard for input. There's voice recognition. You can actually write out the Chinese. So we're kind of back to the days of, calligraphy and handwriting, right? We can write out character on the key on, on your touchpad, 
And so there are lots of different ways where I feel like the language machine interaction is becoming coming closer and closer to how humans would normally think and interact. It's a cool element that's add on. Sometimes you'll do there'll be a process going on for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and they think we're getting to that thing. But before you get now, there's something else that it's an altered form. Like this is no longer now. This is the only way we're gonna. And maybe we'll go back to something we did 60 years ago. So now it's like, let's backtrack. You can't map out what's going to show up at a five year. That's why technology always become obsolete. There's a there's a wonderful little museum. I think it's still there at the Science Center at Harvard. If you go on campus, the, the Science Center is the building that looks like a like a like a like a it's meant to look like a Polaroid, like Kodak, you know, it's like a like a camera basically. Yeah. And there's this this an this a nice little museum of scientific instruments. And when you go in there, you have no idea what they're really for. Because you know, instruments are always you know made to precisely bridge the gaps, right, in our ability to directly interact with the machine to make machine do what we want them to do. So a lot of technology are kind of just filling the gaps. So you think of you know that's why like in some, many ways my book is precisely structured that way. It's seven chapters. Each chapter deals with a particular kind of technological puzzle or bottleneck you know, that they had to get through in order to then advance to the next stage, which then the next chapter builds on. So it's about series, it's about innovations and failures and people who were behind them, the human characters behind each written character that make sure that the Chinese language would survive. One thing that comes to mind is the, you brought up the QWERTY keyboard and that made me think of items in the world that are fixed in place and not representative of the current moment if we were to remake them. Some cities look like that where if we got rid of all the buildings and rebuilt them, we'd not build them the way they were right now, but it just got stuck that way and you can't just remove everybody's homes or something. Is there any elements of the Chinese language as it currently is that are fixed in place, but inefficient? And also, why is the non-simplified form more popular on Google Translate, I think, or was the other way around? In the simple, uh, simple I'm not sure if non trans I, I'm not sure if non you mean the traditional form is more popular on Google Translate. Actually, I'm not sure that's the case. I think you can switch between the two systems. I think Google Translate a, a comp accompanies both. It does both. One of them was more popular. Yeah. It's probably simplified because maybe more people use simplified. Yes. yes. But um the 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 well, it's actually a great question because if you ask all linguists, any linguist, they would say that all languages tend towards simplification. And if that were true, one could say that then that must mean that the written Chinese language should not have survived, right? It has so many different strokes. It has, there's so many of them and it takes so, so much time and energy to learn. But lo and behold, Chinese has not only survived, but it's actually in some ways excelled and exceeded expectations. Because right now, Chinese companies like Baidu actually lead in the AI area of natural language processing. So, you know, this process where I talk about having machines read your language, like that's always our dream is to have our thoughts directly, you know, transfer into the machine, have the machine, you know, print it out, write it out for us. Baidu, the Chinese language processing technology is actually making really, tremendous progress in some ways that I think just a couple of years ago surpassed Google, although they're always neck and neck. So I think that's one of the many things that you think about. Yes, there, there are some things about language that's cumbersome, but the solution, you know, you can go two ways with a solution. One is to transform the language itself, which China had also done. And the second is to find technological solutions that would then render, that would neutralize the difficulty or the barrier, right, that is posed by having a difficult language system. And I basically think that the Chinese script revolution of the 20th century took a two-pronged approach to this, right? And on the one hand, it really did something to simplify its writing system, the simplified form, which is a way of thinning out characters so that it has fewer strokes, so it's easier to learn, obviously. The other is to romanize it, using a, you know, coming with a standard way of romanizing it to render into Western alphabet. Even though, but you know, but all this is re recognition that these ways of making Chinese language more amenable to technology and to, let's say, to be user friendly to people who are non Chinese speakers, it comes at a cost, right? Because when you look at Romanized Chinese, 
one of the most important things that we haven't touched on when we talk about the quirkiness of the properties of Chinese language is tones. You know, people don't think that the Chinese language is that, you know, the, the, it's a tonal language, which, you know, as English speakers, we don't notice. But frankly, we always speak in tone. Tone just means pitch. And even the way that you and I talk right now, we're not talking flat like machines, right? There's actually a variation. Like when you, when I ask you a question, when you ask me a question, why well, I say yes versus yes, those are two actually different pitches. And if you map down to Chinese tonal system, in Mandarin, that would be the second tone, yes, which goes up. And the fourth tone, yes, that goes down. But in Chinese, it does not mean the difference between a question mark and a kind of explanation mark. It really is the difference between a second tone and a fourth tone. But all that is lost in the representation in Roman letters. Because one of the, one of the reasons that Chinese characters is as difficult as it is visually, or as complicated, is actually for good reasons. It's so that you can differentiate between all these characters. You know, they have very refined meanings. And also because Chinese language has a huge number of homophones. We have some examples of that in the English language, like for instance, a kernel of a corn, right? Versus a kernel in the military. So, you know, in Chinese, there's a lot more characters that use the same sound. And so in some ways, if you're reading Chinese character, you will know exactly what characters meant because of the physical specificity of each character, right? But if you were to just render them on 26 letters, obviously there are many more characters than what 26 letters can represent. So you really just have, a lot more, you know, characters that are, look the same in Roman letters, but without the ability to distinguish between them, because the tonal marks is missing, and the physical details are missing. So there are certain kinds of, you know, ways in which, you know, Chinese, you know, try to modernize, but also recognize that it could never really, truly abolish Chinese writing system altogether, because it doesn't want to, first of all, and also, second of all, the script itself has its utility right? It's, it's expressiveness and the amount of information that it contains is just of greater, is a greater asset than to actually go wholesale romanization just for the convenience of, you know, telegraphy or typewriting or computing. Right. Like on a QWERTY keyboard that is very inefficient. One thing is, that's kind of cool. Anything that lasts a long time, something kept it going. I've always had that theme for any category. If it wasn't relevant in some way, or even a personality trait of someone I know, if, if it wasn't relevant ever, it wouldn't be there. There must be some time where that comes out as a valuable thing. Now, one thing I like that you mentioned is breaking it down into code. And I like how you describe the elements like Unicode, and it relates to ASCII. When I was little, I would uh, use like alt and numbers to make codes on the um, computer and make shapes and whatnot. And it's nice to have some background connected to that because I didn't even, another thing I didn't process at the time that I'm like, oh, okay, wait a minute, this was this. Um, do you look at most languages as a coding on top of, yeah, like a base? And as humans, if we went and communicated with each other, we'd find a way to communicate. Eventually we get some code. And also I want to add in, this is not just episode 337. This is project 337, which was one of the like uh, naming uh, efforts. What do you think about the concept of like a co common base and then languages like on top of that? Well, I think that is what Unicode is. You talked about the use of SCII, ESCII before. That's what you were playing with when you were a child. Well, you know, as there, there's a kind of some people talk about ESCII imperialism. Right, they call it that because ESCII was originally designed. It's, it's it stands for you know American Standard, yeah. right, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really made for American English, and computing was in fact it started in Silicon Valley. And ESCII, so therefore, when it was originally designed, it was really meant for twenty six letters of the alphabet. Now, is it fair to call that imperialism? It's imperialistic in the sense that looking back now, we see how computers dominate every aspect of our lives. And so it feels like it was imperialistic. But at the time, 
the inventors and you know the, the brains behind ESCII had no idea it was going to be <laughs> huge. They had no idea that computing was going to dominate the world, that it was going to spread far and wide to all corners of the earth. And so it was really kind of the, the, the first mover advantage, I think, as I mentioned before, explains that better because it was the first one. But then later when you have more complicated writing system like ideographic writing system, like Chinese characters and also used by Japan and Korea, then you have to have like, for instance, one of the problem was, you know, ESCII was, was just kind of a seven bit length and you need a lot more stores than that to code a Chinese character, right? Just because it's visually, it just carries more information to having more details to convey. And so, you know, it had to basically build out the ESCII structure. So when you're talking about, is there a base on which all languages are built? Well, ESCII is kind of that base and then kind of the, the coding system, right? Or even using binaries and how you can use that to code every other language system so that all human languages are represented in the computing, in, in cyberspace, essentially, that it's possible to communicate. So I think that's already, that is the, the, that's already the foundation of the world we live in. I had spoken with a BBC tech correspondent, his name is Rory Ketlin Jones, and he mentioned how each element of technology over time looked like a fad. A lot of them for the first few years, they said, oh, the internet, no, it's not gonna, computers, no, it's not gonna. So to, yeah, so each development doesn't look like the huge impact it might have 50 years later. And oh, wait a minute, we have to look back now at, uh, is this like a country versus country or a ideology versus ideology causing comparison? that we need to backtrack on. But at the time it might be someone tinkering around and I got to develop this thing and push forward. Should and we? Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And I also think, you know, technology is as good as the humans who design it. And this is actually one of the conversations behind AI, right? Because, you know, it's like the, the, what they call, what they say is garbage in, garbage out. So it's gonna depend on how good your data is. And if the data you put in reflect your cultural or you know, your cultural prejudice against, let's say, people who look a certain way or, you know, people who talk or, or write a certain way. I mean, if that's your data, then your technology is going to come out skewed as well. Right. So there's something about technology that's it's I always think of technology as kind of a stopgap measure. It's not clear that it's always a technology meant to, you know, end all be all. I don't think that's really possible. And, um, and it's always meant to, you know, fix a kind of, it's always, it's a solution, you know, it's a solution to a problem. And very few cases where you have, you know, um, a solution out there looking for a problem, right? Usually we kind of, we solve problems, not the other way around. And so I do think that, you know, technologies are, you can say it's fad and I'm not sure that's exactly it because also, um, you know, it's, it's, it, there's certain technology for technology's sake, but I think it's also, it has to at least to be under the guise of being a solution to something, to a need. I like that you mentioned that I'm not sure if it was Steve Jobs or somebody Apple related had mentioned that we look at what the problems are and then we go to solve versus having engineers with great skills and reaching out to make um, or having items that they built. And then what can we apply this to is much more inefficient uh, or has always been more inefficient because you're not speaking to the direct need as much as when it shows up. We really need this. Okay, we're going to put our uh, brain power to work on this issue. And I agree with you too that sometimes technology is kind of like um, it's a tail that wags a dog, right? I mean, for instance, I, you know, I tried to, I was, I was, I, every, if I add up, the, the number of times and the amount of time I waste every day trying to disentangle my headset. And it's true, I could just go become a Bluetooth user, but I don't. And if mm -hmm. I, I think about how much time I actually spent, the, the mental aggravation that it cost me to disentangle all my headsets, you know, it's, it's a way to, and I conform myself to become, you know, my, my fingers no doubt have become more nimble, you know, through, you know, the acrobatics of disentangling. And also think about how we conform to technology, even the way we sit, you know, we came up, we built something like a chair 
and with that we can back into with our behind pointing backwards first. I mean, it's a pretty marvelous way of that we are always like, in some ways we create things to make our lives easier, but we're also kind of molding into it, right? So there's a kind of symbiotic relationship and when, you know, and, and people draw graver consequences from it, right? How, you know, we like social media, we're so used to, you know, we talk to people like this in front of a screen, we lose the kind of empathy we have when, for instance, when I look at you, you look at me, even we're on Zoom, there's a kind of face-to-face -face interaction. I'm appreciative of how responsive you are. When I say headset, you look at your headset. When I say QWERTY, you look down your QWERTY keyboard, right? So there's none of this will really happen if we're just texting about all this. Right. Which might be a, a different format, Armin, that you want to try, which is a text interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, by the way, just to throw that in there for the people out there, I have done text interviews and actually we'll be doing one. Funny enough, I haven't done one in a long while, but we'll be doing one uh, soon just by text. But I do uh, lean towards more, I look at it like bandwidth levels, like uh, text, then audio, then video, then potentially in the future, like uh, virtual, virtual, like uh, with goggles or whatnot. Kind of being, and then in person, obviously, is the top yeah. end. Well, you know, luckily, I think the technology of language is something that's different from all other technologies. Um, because it really is, you know, something that's so interconnected with our thought process, you know, our experience of who we are, our identity, you know, the utility, uh, our pride of using a certain kind of national language the necessity of communication. I mean, language is so intimate to who we are, right? I mean, we're constantly expressing ourselves to language. We interact, we experience our social reality. We try to change it through language. So technologies that are meant to enhance language, I think also has additional kind of relevance and a kind of significance that other technologies might not have. On the note of language, I would like to check how did the language revolution make China modern. How would you encapsulate that as far as the past 100, 120 years and where China is today due to their language? Well, I think that if, you know, as a historian, we like to think counterfactuals, you know, what if something had not happened? So if China had not held on to his language, if it had gone with what its late 18th century script reformer said, which was, oh, why don't we just do without it and come up with a different phonetic system to represent it that's easier. For instance, you know, some combination or alphabet letters with some other symbols like shorthand, you know, they actually drew from like Isaac Pittman's shorthand, David Lindsley's shorthand. You know, what if we did that? Well, if we had done that, I think in some ways the result would be disastrous for China because it would have, you know, it wouldn't have been forced to build an edge for itself technologically. Because one of the, you know, one of the one of the important things that it spurred China to do was to basically not only learn all the, you know, the, the logic, the principles, to learn from the success and the dominance of the Western alphabet, but to also force them to think about how they can one up the Western alphabet, right? How they can be better, not only be on the receiving end, but also be better. So had they not kept their own language system, they wouldn't have that ability because a critical thing that happened in the 70s, which I talk about in the book, was that there was a, precisely because of the computing age, there was, intense need and demand to try to universalize the use of technology, uh, uh, use of language technology, like in print, right? Um, a digitally assisted print, kind of early electric machines, you know, basically early computers. Um, and in China, they, made, they put the emphasis on actually being able to type, basically essentially being able to use Chinese characters and computing systems. And this became a huge niche for Western companies who want to break into the Chinese market. And so they were all racing, you know, trying to, you know, they came, all came knocking on China's doors, trying to, you know, uh, propose their own writing system. Um, you know, I'm mean, sorry, to propose their own uh, computing machines that can code Chinese and print Chinese and et cetera. And that was when the Chinese realized, aha, we actually, lo and behold, we actually have an edge. And that is no more than the fact that everybody wants to be able to crack the Chinese code and that is our language. And so we should seize on it 
to use it as a way of creating a kind of technological advantage right, to create an edge over others. If we can be in control of our own language technology, and that would be a great resource and a great advantage and a great product for the rest of the world to couple with Western computing technologies who need our missing piece because they want to break in the Chinese market. So had China not done that, had they not kept their own language, it would have no leverage. It would have no niche in which to create a kind of technical a technological advantage, which it now does in like automatic translation, right? I mean, all these critical ways of how you, you know, I mean, how you basically, you know, language information is the first data, right? We now talk about data as the new oil, you know, because data is also like images, face recognition. We talk about that kind of data, but data originally, data was language, written records, rendered somehow into the computer. I had a one time I made a rap song where I had a lyric that said, Data's the new oil. Rockefeller would get jealous if he had some zeal, then Google's overzealous. Because I was talking about it at that Wait time. Did you say that this is your song that you Yeah, rap? I made one many years ago. Yeah, I rap about the, the internet. I've made a bunch of raps. I made a lot of content, but that was one. I mean, I certainly, I, I obviously did not do enough of background check on <laughs> all right, before I perhaps fool, you know, foolishly took on this interview, but I'm glad it's gone well so far. It was an informative rap about the internet and i doubt i was mentioning the value of data like there was data privacy issues coming up in the news at the time so i included that and it is like the new oil i've read quite a bit about data and the importance of it <laughs> that's funny um that's classic and then the power struggles i like to mention that the if you have something that is your item of uh, ability that people want there was one person he, he was a popular individual and a lot of rich people wanted to hang out with them and he said well if i'm so cool and you want to hang out with me show me how to become successful or else it's almost like you're taking from my thing but not uh, handing on your end same thing i like that you presented with china and their language if they just don't take their special item and capitalize on that then it'll be almost disregarded because you have to put value on something first before others can I, I like that. I, I, I thank you for picking that up because I think one of the things that really made me think a lot about writing this book is to just witness, to excavate a process of how, how advantage is created from nowhere. Because, you know, the story, the book really is a story about China and the West. And, you know, the lore that we now hear and think we know about, it's always this idea of the national humiliation, the hundred years of humiliation, you know, China catching up, China was behind, so on and so forth. And what I uncovered in this book is really that at every point, it was striving to counter the kind of advantage that, you know, of which it could not enjoy, right? So telegraphy, China learned, it was chapter three, how China entered into telegraph and Morse code. It had no advantage because Morse code was only for letters and China, the, the Danes who were the, you know, the, the dominant power and they had the, the great Northern Telegraphic Company, they basically forced telegraphy onto China by stealthily building these telegraphic lines. And they also forced an encoding system, a telegraphic coding system for the Chinese language on Chinese, which were not at all easy for Chinese to use and was prone to mistakes and were super expensive because Chinese had to be rendered in as numbers in Morse code, right? Because Morse code was, there was Morse code for alphabet letters. There was also Morse code for numbers. And so since Chinese couldn't be rendered into letters at the time, then it was rendered into numbers, which were much more expensive to send. So, you know, Chinese had been learning on the receiving end of technology. And so the book really also through the process really to think about, okay, how did they first of all dig themselves out of the hole and but then also trying to use that as a way of creating an advantage. See, this is why I always feel like, you know, one reason I like stories about the underdog and I love, you know, uncovering stories of the underdog is that underdogs have to do twice the work, right? Not only do they have to, you know, find to catch up, so to speak, but at the same time, they also have to figure out how to get ahead. So they're always under working under kind of a double imperative. And so the story really is about, and how did that happen? How, like, especially when you read, um, you know, in the 50s and 60s, 
Cultural Revolution, when China had no resources, no way to compete. How was it already thinking about that? You know, how is engineers and you know intellectuals were already trying to think about how do we create a future? And the story really is the entire book is about these um, what I called second and the third stringers of history. So not your first stringers, like the ones we all celebrate and love to read, the martyrs, the revolutionary, even the small little people, right? These are kind of the the people in between, kind of like people like you you know, like you and me, who decided to go against the grain that they were gonna devote themselves to something bigger than themselves, that you know, they were the ones, they were the bricklayers of history who had to pick up the pieces after every glorious bloody revolution, after every big event, cataclysmic event, they actually the ones who went in there, you know, with a broomstick, pick up the pieces and figure out, you know, how do we sweep all this together put things back where they are and build something. So, you know, there, this, why this Chinese script revolution, I really think of it as it was a tr true people's revolution. And I don't, know, I don't mean people in a Mao sense, you know, I don't mean people in the way that is invoked by governments. I really mean the, every Chinese person or even non-Chinese, there's a lot of Europeans in here, adventurers, you know, and, and, and you know, linguists and, you know, quirky types who actually got involved in this Chinese language revolution as well. And these were all people who were just, they were all united by their love and obsession with the language. So to me, it was a pretty remarkable, uh, remarkable story and a history that's so little known to the outside. It was the longest revolution of the 20th century because it lasted throughout the entire century. And in fact, if you want to be really accurate. I want to be accurate. You want to be accurate. <laughs> The revolution, it's this has been an ongoing process for more than 470 years since the first Jesuits came to China, brought a little romanization system and tried to figure out how to pronounce Chinese. So they were kind of first to notating Roman letters as little cheat sheets to themselves. But also through that, the Chinese also saw, wow, there's like a different way of understanding the sounds, of representing the sounds of our spoken languages. And I say languages because China at the time, it's not just one spoken, it's not just the Mandarin or Putonghua you hear today. It had hundreds of dialects. Even the Chinese could not understand themselves, which is why the book starts <laughs> with the unification of the national tongue with one of my favorite characters, the fake Buddhist monk, right? Who came back, who was actually a political fugitive, who came back to China determined to unify how Chinese was spoken. That was the first step. And there's just kind of the door that opened up to the rest of the book. So I like that there's, there is like underdogs. There's people in the book, there's a lot of individuals who were, um, their life wasn't so relaxed, I'd say. There were some prison elements and not enjoyable items. And then towards their effort, it's the doers, if you will. And I always resonate with the doers as well. They may not be as, noticed right away or top credit form and they may not um be just all right with things as they are they they take on the weight of i have to be the base of the next elements of change if i don't do this i guess it's it's not that many people it's just us that'll do it so there's a weight to that yeah the, the book is really filled with you know i i never thought i would experience this but i really was these human characters that I dug up, you know, in excavating this history of Chinese script. Of course, the Chinese language is a true protagonist of the book, but without these human characters who try to save it, who try to prop it up, who try to reform it, who defied it, repudiated it, you know, without their own love-hate relationship to the language, there would not have been this book because it's just extraordinary how, you know, with this one common denominator, the love of the Chinese language, it brought Chinese and Westerners alike together in a common pursuit for different purposes and to different ends. I admit that, but also just the, you know, just this global pursuit of, you know, modernizing Chinese, which is such a, such a remarkable, just a, such a remarkable history to uncover. And I just also want to show with this book how, you know, our given our current political climate says otherwise, but I wanted to show how you know, China and the West had long learned and live with one another, you know, in collaboration even. Um, they have long done this before they turned foes. 
So I just thought at a moment like this, it's kind of important to be reminded of that, how it is possible and has been done many times before to both collab to be collaborators and competitors. And so the the I just and there's a way of also also I feel like, you know, humanizing, you know, at the time when in the West or in the United States, we think our greatest adversary is China. I think it's important to humanize your greatest adversary. Um, not because then you become sympathetic with them and you side with them. That's not the reason. It's really because you can understand their motivations better because their motivations you can relate to. And then maybe you will come up with better strategies and anticipating you know, their next moves or what would, you know, what would bring them around and et cetera, et cetera. So that was that was the purpose of the book, and I'm I'm glad you enjoyed it. I love having this conversation with you. So thank you for thank you for reaching out to me. Glad too. By the way, on that point, I have to add in the foe like element is so key because you can only see someone as a foe after there was already some shared element, or else they'd just be a stranger you never knew. And then every person in a category that has people that oh these are my uh, people I'm battling with. Thirty years later, you wish you would hang out with those people because. Nobody else was in you, with you in that time period that was part of your network of, oh, okay, we're doing this and I have to compete with them here. But 30 years later, everybody else was in some other category. You can't even relate with them. You'd want to go have a tea with them or something. So actually, I really appreciate you pointing that out because I think that's, you know, that's actually a great message in some ways to our, our common conclusion to end on, which is, you know, in some ways, China has never been more like America. And that's exactly why the nervousness, right? The sense that they might overtake, you know, America. And it's really because the two have never been more alike. And so whether that commonality can only generate strife or whether there, it can also generate a sign of better mutual understanding is something that I think will unfold in the next several years. But in the meantime, the world is certainly not a boring place. <laughs> I think that's the least that one could say. No, it is not. Professor Jing Su, I would like to say, one, I've been very responsive because this is super enjoyable and the themes connect with me. I had like eight of them ran through my head during our discussion. The book is Kingdom of Characters, The Language Revolution That Made China Modern. I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode or project of the show and giving us a sense of the language, the history, and uh, where it leads China and the language today. Thank you so much, Armin. That was so fun. And remember, you might want to learn Farsi someday too, right? <laughs> Possibly, and maybe other languages. And we are out.